Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Rolling Stories, the HR podcast that distill the experience and insights from HR leaders and experts around the world. And today mark our season four after more than 1,000 minutes of conversation in season three. Now, the team and I was wondering, how do we make season four even better? How can we top that? Well, how about starting the season with a legend? Our guest today is Dave Urich. He's a professor at University of Michigan, a partner at RBL Group, a consulting firm that helps organizations and leaders deliver value, and most importantly, a prolific author of more than 30 books and 200 articles and topics such as organization, leadership, and human resources. He has also received numerous awards and recognition for his contribution to the field. Dave is very well known in the space, in the HR space around the world, and most importantly, his ability to turn complex ideas into simple solutions. So today, we are very fortunate to have him here today. Dave, welcome to the show. Adrian, what a privilege to be with you. Thank you so much especially this fourth season. What a delight to join you. You're most welcome. And thank you so much for making time with us today. Where does this podcast find you? I'm in my home office. So welcome to my office. It's always interesting. We feel like we're distanced because of technology, but in some ways we're closer because you can see the things on my shelf. You can see up on my shelf. You can see the things to the side of my shelf. You can see the things to the side of my desk. And so we get to peek into people's offices, which is, I think, actually quite interesting. So welcome to my home office in the United States. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving us a peek to how you actually operate in your home office. And I do understand that we have seen you in many different instances over here in Singapore. The last time you were here was in 2020. I'd like to touch a bit about your observation back then. But maybe let's start with something over the past year. From through a HR lens, what surprised you the most in 2023? I think HR has been around for a long time. It's not a new agenda. And coming out of COVID, which was such a shock to all of our systems, I think what people said during COVID is a people problem. It's a health problem. It's a morale problem. And the changes in 2023 have not gone away around the world. We've seen political changes. We've seen upheaval in the Ukraine. We've seen upheaval in the Mideast. We've seen economic upheaval. We've seen a huge amount of AI upheaval and technology. All of those continue that legacy of the people agenda, which I think COVID really highlighted. And so the question we used to have is, will HR get to the business table, mythical table? Will it be part of the conversation? That's no longer a question. HR is the conversation, people, organization, and it's staying. It's not a blip in COVID. It's staying because of AI, because of economic uncertainty, because of the political unrest, because of demographics. It's there and it's going to stay. And how do you then believe that HR leaders might be able to emphasize or leverage on those key challenges and opportunities that's brought about due to pandemic, due to the market situation. And I also want to ask from an Asia perspective, because I have heard many instances about how advanced or what are some of the things that HR could do in the business. But from an Asia perspective, would it be slightly different based on your observation when you were back in Singapore, the last time was in 2010? Are there the observable differences between HR? 2010 was one of my uh, first times. Asia versus and I should US. just share that in, and I don't know if it was 2010 or exactly the day, but it was 15 years ago. I was doing a big session just so that you get a sense of who I am. And it was in front of a large group and I happened to have gained weight. And at the first break, the young woman who was hosting me came up and she said, professor, you have big hole in your pants. So my first experience in Singapore is I moon Singapore and I quickly put my jacket around my pants and had to go to my room and change my pants. I think it's gotten better since then. My weight's maybe not gotten better, but I'm not (laughs) mooning Singapore. I think what we're seeing in HR is, is it sounds like an easy shift, but it's not. And let me describe it with an example. When I do a workshop, I love to start with the question, turn your name tent over and write down what's the biggest challenge in your job today. And what HR people talk about today is hybrid work, skill-based organization, executive compensation. I looked at your extremely good sessions last year. You had great topics, leadership, culture, hybrid. And my comment is when you walk into a room of business leaders, a board of directors, an executive team, a set of investors, don't start there. That's interesting. Start with the business. Hmm. What do our customers need for us to succeed in the marketplace? What do our investors need for them to have more confidence in our efforts? 
And so my takeaway is what HR is learning how to do is to not talk about HR as HR, but about HR as a source of value for the business. So to make that concrete, if your listeners are listening saying, what's the biggest challenge in your job today? And don't name a person. That would not be a good idea because that's political. But what's the challenge? It's culture change. It's leadership. It's hybrid work. It's skill-based organization. It's re retention of good people. And then put behind it two words. So that. So that. If I manage mm -hmm. that change better, what's going to happen? To my strategy? Will we implement a new strategy? To my customers? To my investors? And when we begin to start with the so that question, HR is no longer about HR. It's about helping succeed in the business. That's the mental shift and the practical application that I think in HR mm. we've been working around for some time. And all the analytics, all the tools begin to support that mm. agenda. It does sound quite like a simple solution so that, and it sounds so commonsensical, but at least from what I've been observing, it has taken like forever. And still ongoing for HR to adopt this so that mindset. Well, in your opinion, why do you think well, that? Let me, I haven't listened to all of your episodes. They're amazing. But go back to some of your episodes. What percent of time did your guests talk about customers, investors, delivering strategy, mm -hmm. making technology happen? To me, that's the essence of HR today. It's not about culture alone. It's not about leadership. It's doing those things so that our customers and investors from the interaction we have with them. And so it's set up to fall into we, as HR people, as supply chain people, as marketing, as manufacturing, we focus on what we know and do, mm -hmm. not on the outcomes of what we know and do. And the theory, I mean, it's, again, it's not new. I don't know if you're in a relationship or married, but when I give my wife a gift, got to show the picture. There's wife. Okay. Over there. <laughs> When I give my <laughs> wife a gift, she defines the value of the gift. In HR, we don't define the value of what we do. Our investors do because they invest in the company. Our customers do because they mm. do more business with the company. Our business leaders do because they help make strategy happen. That mindset is really tricky to get embedded. I don't do it all the time. I make a mistake. Mm. But that's the mindset I think we're focused about. I know my next question may be a bit... 101, but for HR who have been so ingrained, so institutionalized to think the HR way, what are some recommended baby steps for them to be more open up or to be more able to relate to the business impact so that they could slowly but surely go towards that direction? I'd start with a really 101 comment. Who's going to benefit because of what I do tomorrow? Because of what I did last week, who will be the beneficiary? And will it be an employee? Probably. Hopefully the employees will be more engaged. They'll be more committed. They'll be more positive. Is it the business? Hopefully our business strategy will be more likely to happen. Is it a customer? Is it an investor? Is it the community? For example, when we started, one of the questions I ask you, Adrian, about this podcast is who's the audience? What is it we can do in this 25 or 30 minutes that will be of help to them? Mm. Because, and somebody will say to you or to me, how is your podcast? And the answer is don't ask me. Ask the customer, ask the listener. And getting mm. that mindset into our heads is really, in some ways, simple. But then we have to filter what we know and do through that agenda. Okay, understood. And the other thing that I So like I'm going to ask you, understand. what do you want the listeners of this podcast to get? Not just from me, but from the whole fourth season. What do you hope they get from your podcast? What's, and again, the value is not you. It's what listeners get because mm. of what you do. What would you hope they get from this podcast this season? I think collectively what we hope to get from the listeners is for them to really put into practice what is necessary to drive the organization forward. I am in line with what you said that whether you're in HR, you're in marketing, you're in operations, ultimately all this should have some kind of direct or indirect impact to the business bottom line. Because you just cannot take these two items separately. You can't just have, oh, we, we are the best em employer of the year, but then the company is losing money. It just doesn't work out. So how do you then make sure that everything is well connected? How do you remain profitable at the same time be employer of the choice? So I think those are things that HR, at least based, based on the target audience, have to really think about whatever they do, they are not doing and operating in a silo. It would have some material impact or rippling effect 
on other departments. So I think that is something that I guess we hope our listeners would think about as they continue to advance in their work. You should do the podcast. That was a great answer. <laughs> so let me give you an example. We want to be the employer of choice. That's a great idea, employee engagement. So that we are the vendor of choice. So that we're the customer of choice. And so if a company is doing an employee engagement survey, whatever you define it, the 12 item index from Gallup or some other survey, are you correlating that with customer engagement? Are you showing that employee retention is highly correlated to customer retention? And when you begin to make that bridge, for example, a few years ago, employee engagement experience was a hot topic. When I started, I read through those books because I love to read. I love to learn. What percent of those articles and books talked about customers or investors? And it was small. To me, that's where we, and you just described it beautifully. As a result of this podcast, we hope you, a listener, have some actions you can take so that you are more effective in your day-to-day -day work. Boy, it seems so simple, but it's not easy to do. It's not easy to do. Think about gifts that we give. I don't know if you've ever given mm. one of your loved ones a gift that didn't really work for them because you thought, oh, this oh it just happened. Has that just happened? Yeah, it just happened last week. <laughs> well, are you willing to share? What did you give? Well, I have a big family, so I sometimes run out of ideas on what to get for some of them. <laughs> so some of it did not pan out quite well. No, I just did the same. We had our uh, holiday and I gave my wife gifts and she said, oh, thank you very much. I already have that. And I'm going, and the value is not what we give. It's, and my wife has given me some incredible gifts on my birthdays and celebrations that are really meaningful to me. And it's the same thing in HR. The gift we give is not what we know and do. It's how what we know and do helps others feel better about themselves. And those others could be employees, mm -hmm. no question. Could be customers, could be the business itself, its strategy, could be investors, could be the community. And when we begin to make that connection, then HR is not about HR. It's about creating value for mm -hmm. others through the work that we do. Right. And I'd like to segue into something else that everyone else is talking about. So I think we should also go into it, which is generative AI. Ah, I knew that's what you were uh, going to talk about. It, it's the hot topic right now. It's the hot topic. Yes, I have to put this into the show notes so that you can help us to drive more listenership. So Gen AI is something that I personally have been exploring over the past year. I only had a chance to, to see it over the past year. It came in only recently. And I feel that it has been a godsend for me. But then again, my work is more on the marketing aspect. In the HR space, what are some of the things that you've been seeing and some of the things that would really, I wouldn't say revolutionize, but have really amplified how HR has gone about doing their work by leveraging on generative AI? Let me tell a story that gives my view and then I'll directly answer your question. I have, we have three children, two of which are professors. They called me mm. early this year and said, dad, my job's over. No student will ever write a paper again because they're going to go to chat GPT or generative AI and they're going to turn in a paper. Mm. I have no idea what I'm going to do. I said, okay, I'm going to test this. So I got on and I said, write a 200 word essay on the future of HR. Boom. Mm. Less than a minute later, 200 word essay. And I read it and I thought my job's over. It was a great essay. And then I stopped and I read it again. Here's what Gen AI does. It goes into the codice of data that's in the internet. And they spent billions of dollars being able to do this with amazing algorithms. And it summarizes beautifully what's been done. So when I read the 200 word essay again, I said, Ooh, that's by Linda Grattan. That's by Ed Lawther. That's by Peter Capelli. That's by me. The essay was a summary beautifully done of what's been done, but it wasn't the future. It wasn't the future because it can't create a future. It can only synthesize the past. The other thing I discovered, and I don't know if you've seen it on LinkedIn or Instagram or whatever social media, sometimes people ask you a question and the 20 best friends answer the question. And then they say, here's the results of this survey. Chat GPT, when it goes into that data set, doesn't know how to separate good from bad data. And so the data that's out there sometimes is actually pretty bad. A survey of my 20 friends is not going to tell me the latest trend. We have data in our research from 100, well, the last round of research was 28,000 people. 
Singapore was involved as part of the sample for testing what HR should know and do. And what ChatGPD says is it says, here's the 20 person best friends of Adrian, and here's the 28,000 person study, and they're equal. Well, they're not equal. So when I looked at those two things, I said, it's a great tool for synthesizing the past as long as we're careful what we're synthesizing. We've got to learn how to judge it. It doesn't yet create the future. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote an essay. Here's what I think the future of HR is. Now, eight months later, that's going to be in what people source. The human creativity. <laughs> and it was really fun. I got invited this year to Amazon AWS, which is their web service conference. 60,000 people show up. I think what we're seeing with Amazon and Microsoft and Google and all of these incredible companies is an incredible ability to synthesize what's been done. So what does that mean? I want to design a job for a software engineer. Okay. Software engineer working in a government agency. Pat Kim might be doing some of that. She's brilliant, by the way. You're lucky to have her in your country. So I do a chat GPT and I say, what skills should a software engineer in a public service organization have? Boom. One minute, I got a list of skills. Here's the danger. That's what's been hmm. done. It's not what needs to be done going forward. The skills of the future may not be the skills of the past. And so I think chat GPT does away with looking back because we can look back quickly. It doesn't do away with creating forward and it doesn't have the ability to then say, so which of those skills will work in my situation? So that research needs to say, wow, you've given me a list of 10 skills in the past that have worked in my situation, given ABCD, where should we focus? And I think that's where we're going to see chat GPT as an incredible enabler coupled with human creativity. And then we begin to help HR go forward. I think some of the, when shared services came out and we had 1-800 numbers, a high 1-800 HR loves you. It's going to do away with HR. It did away with benefit processing. It did away with paperwork. It did away with spreadsheets. I think chat GPT is going to do away with some of the literature reviews but it won't replace creativity and innovation. Okay. I'm reminded of a joke that I've read when ChatGPT first came out, which is all of us should really start taking care of our health because our future doctor may have passed his or her exam with ChatGPT. So, uh, well, and that's the issue. If your you're health from. problem is a problem that's been solved by the last 50 doctors, that's great. But what if your health problem is a little bit different because of your background, because of your genetics, mm. because of who you are, Chat GPT may lead you down a pathway that says you're generic, but it may not be what's unique about you. And in that light, again, I think we get scared when we rely on technology to start making decisions for us. Yeah, I, I can completely understand how horrible situation may pan out if we have been reliant 100% on Chat GPT. Imagine when COVID-19 first came out and the people were using Chat GPT to try to find answers. They'd be looking at solutions that we deployed for SARS and we would still be having COVID-19 right now. That, that's the whole point. We knew how to do SARS. We knew how to do infectious disease, but COVID-19 was a different disease and it continues to be different. So we, and again, that's where I think if I were doing a PhD today, I wouldn't have to do all the literature review. I can pick up a lot of that based on chat GPT, mm -hmm. but hopefully the thought leadership that takes me the next step is where I think analytics need to go. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think analytics gets really creative. It says, think about your last season. I don't know how many episodes you had, but they were, I glanced through them on the internet. They were amazing. How many episodes did you have last season? Last season, I think we have about 20 over. Yeah, 20, 22 episodes. Here's the question I've got. You had 22 thoughtful colleagues share ideas about helping people and organizations succeed. Mm. Given my organization, and if I'm a listener, where am I? A public agency, a not-for-profit firm, mm. an airline, I'm in Tomasic, wherever I am, which of those 22 episodes will give me the insights that will help me next year? ChatGPT won't tell me. That's going to require human judgment. Mm. And so having that cafeteria or menu, somebody explained it this way. There are 118 elements on the chemical chart whatever that's called, but the hundred, and I'm not a mm. chemist, but there's 118 elements. That's the cafeteria. That's the menu. Creates the objects, creates the lifestyle. 
Chat GPT is 118 elements. We then bring them mm. together to create what's unique for my business. And that requires incredible human judgment. So I, I guess with that, it also means that some HR who may be concerned that ChatGPT or generative AI may take over their job could really be rest assured. But it doesn't mean that they are going to rest in their laurels. It still require a bit of using their own judgment to importantly look at how the context would have to fit in their organization, yep. because this is something that well I do see a lot because I work with so many HR vendors and every time I speak with a new prospect, it will always be, oh no, my company is different. My business is different because it's true. Every business is different. So you can't just take one size fit all answers and expect it to work perfectly Beautiful. in every single situation. You should do a podcast. No, that's <laughs> a great line. I mean, that's the point is it's like picking a diet. I've had people tell me, Dave, to lose weight, one of my friends said, Dave, you need to run every day. Well, he runs every day. He runs six miles a day and it helps him be physically fit. I have some problems with my legs. I can't run. And so I look at him and I say, running is a great move for you. It doesn't work for me. I have to find my way. I have to find my path. And I think chat GPT lays out the options, but then we have to have the judgment and it makes HR's job mm even more difficult. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a silver bullet or a, a quick fix that would solve all the problems? There's not. That's mm -hmm. where our judgment becomes so critical and where analytics, I think, get to be very helpful. And I also want to touch a bit on that, on analytics, because this is something that I have seen came up maybe a few years ago back in Singapore and is still growing. We don't really have a lot of companies that is still applying analytics. But it is something that more companies are looking at with a very keen eye. How, how is it being practiced, at least from your side of the world, which I believe there are a lot more bigger organizations? What are some of the better practices when it comes to analytics? Because for many HR people that I speak with, to them, it's like, again, okay, yeah, we know that we are going to have these attrition numbers. We're going to have this, we're going to have that. And that's it. It's just like, okay, reading a line from a textbook. But how do they make sense of all this information? How do they try to link it up with whatever is happening in the market, in the business? How do they even look at this data from a very good perspective? First of all, let me go back to something you've said now, I think three times, which is so important. We talk about Asia Pacific is different from Africa, is different from Europe, is different from North America and Latin America. One of the things we're learning is that good managing people is the same in many ways across the world. Think about the Jamaican bobsled team. They went to the Olympics and they were the best bobsled team in Jamaica. Eddie the Eagle, a British snow jumper, went to the Olympics as the best snow jumper or skier in Britain, but he didn't win. I think big companies anywhere in the world, and that would be a Tomasic, Singapore Airlines, anywhere in the world learn from each other. And now there are obviously differences. I love the differences when I come to Singapore. Some of my friends are always giving me food and it has a different flavor than food in Latin America, than British food, than American food. The flavor is different, but the four food groups are still the same. Okay. Having said mm. that, I believe analytics has gone through three phases. Phase one is benchmarking. How do I compare against somebody else? And so we love to say, what's my turnover rate in mm. fast food? because fast food has a 70, 80% turnover rate. How do I compare with somebody else? We did a book about that. Phase two of analytics is best practices. We love to say in analytics, who's the best at culture, leadership development. Mm. And we love to, all the books behind me, we love to say, here's the best practice. Level three, benchmarking, best practice, is predictive analytics. Why are they a best practice? Mm. What makes Unilever good at what they do? What makes Singapore Airlines the world's leader or Shanghai Airport the world's mm. leader in airport satisfaction by passengers? And they are. And it was fun to do some work with them to see they're just amazing. Singapore Airline is amazing. That's where analytics is today. You benchmark, how do I compare? You do a best practice, who's really good? You do predictive analytics, why are they good? I think we're moving to a fourth level which we call guidance. What do they have mm. to be good at in the future to succeed? Singapore airport has to continue to improve. 
And analytics today tries to provide guidance based on AI, what's been done, but where do we need to go next in order to be successful in the future? We call that an organization guidance system, which says, am Mm -hmm. I connecting my investments? For example, if a company says culture, leadership, hiring people, training people, paying, well, let me give an example. There's a retail firm, global firm. They convince their executives that managing human capital mattered. Okay, that's an easy, con- uh, you convince. Yes, this is important. And the company said, we're going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars. Woo, that's cool. Then comes the most important question. Where do you spend it? Are you going to spend it mm. on compensation? Are you going to spend it on training? Are you going to spend it on leadership development? Are you going to spend it on building agility? Are you going to spend it on technology and AI? To me, that's guidance. If you say, here's the outcome we started with, customer, investor, we want to get those better. Here's the dial on managing our human capital and our human capability investments. How do we turn those two dials to succeed? That's where analytics Mm -hmm. is headed. Benchmarking is terrific. How do I compare? Best practice is terrific. My friend runs. It's a great practice to manage his health. Predictive analytics, what works for him? But then guidance, what will work for you given the outcomes you care about? We haven't cracked that yet, but that's the direction where I hope analytics is going. So if I'm listening to this podcast, I go, what guidance could I give my executives? Where could Hmm. they invest so that we deliver the outcomes, so that we deliver the outcomes that we as a company care about. And if I can begin mm-hmm. to give guidance on, that's the uh, secret sauce where we're headed. Yeah, I would imagine that would be a secret sauce. People would be willing to pay a lot of money for that because it's literally telling someone, okay, you, you're in a casino, go to that table, you're going to hit blackjack. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Which is very hard for one for someone to make the judgment call on, which is again also something very hard for ChatGPT to tell you where the answer. Well, is. and we and again, I was talking to somebody in private equity and asset management, which is HR on steroids, and we see more of that private equity. We see that asset management, and he said, if you can improve our success rate three to five percent, so we're not saying guaranteed. We guarantee you'll win the slots, but if we can improve a percentage of increase, that's huge. That's the work we're trying to unlock in the next year in analytics. Awesome. With that, this has really been a lovely conversation with you, Dave. Very thank you for your time today and to share with us your insights. I do understand that we'll be seeing you again in Singapore. Could you share a bit more on that? You bet. One of the coolest things, there's almost every country in the world today has an HR federation. Go to the less popular countries, Iraq, Iran. Switzerland, the UK, Finland, the US, Argentina, they're all part of something called the World Federation. The World Federation, and I don't know the rest of the name of HR people or whatever. Every two or three years, they have a conference. In May, it's in Singapore, being hosted in Singapore. I've been privileged to be invited. I don't know the exact date. I don't know if it's locked in yet. It's mid-May where I hope Mm -hmm. I come to Singapore and don't moon Singapore again. That's not my goal, but to share these ideas in person. And uh, it's always exciting. I love coming to Singapore. I love the walk around the mall, around Orchard Orchard Avenue, Orchard Avenue. I love Singapore. I don't like the humidity, but I really love Singapore as a place to be. It's It's a country for me that has really demonstrated that it has very few natural assets in the ground. The assets of Singapore and other countries is above the ground. It's in the minds and heads of the people and organizations. And Singapore has leveraged those assets absolutely brilliantly. Thanks to people like you and others that I've already mentioned. I don't want to start mentioning because there's so many. But Singapore is literally a place where government, industry, organization, people have collaborated Mm. to create an incredibly successful knowledge economy. Thanks for the kind words. And on behalf of all listeners, including myself, we look forward to seeing you in Singapore in May and bumping into you in Orchard Road, hopefully in some air-conditioned shopping malls, not outside where the humidity is killing everyone. But until then, for people who may be keen to learn more about yourself, your work, to find you online, where can they go to? LinkedIn. I've written a lot of books. You were gracious enough to mention it. It takes a year to write a book, a year to produce a book. I post every week on LinkedIn, follow the newsletters. Somebody said, who makes all those comments? I do. (laughs) So I post every week and I make comments every day. 
and I love it. I n- almost never look at who's making the comment. I don't care mm. where the idea comes from. It could come from Iraq. It could come from Chile. It could come from Singapore. It could come from Malaysia. I love the engagement of ideas. And LinkedIn is the platform that I've used. I have a newsletter that's got quite a few mm. subscribers. It's free. People have said you should charge for that. And I'm going, the goal is not to charge. The goal is to share ideas. So I'm available on LinkedIn. Awesome. I'll check it out and we will share it in the show notes. Once again, Dave, thank you so much for making time today. Thank you so much. What a delight. Thank you.